Hello and welcome. I'm Don Palmer, Vice Chair of the U.S. Assistant Election Assistance Commission. The EAC is an independent bipartisan federal agency created by the Help America Vote Act of 2002, designed to help election officials improve the administration of elections and help Americans participate in the voting process. We have been recording conversations with state and local election officials about the different facets of election administration during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm honored to have a conversation with Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose. Secretary LaRose took office as Ohio's 51st Secretary of State on January 14, 2019. Prior to being elected to statewide office, he served two terms in the state Senate representing the 27th Senate District in Northeast Ohio. LaRose started his career by living the dream by enlisting the United States Army with the 101st Airborne and ultimately served in U.S. Special Forces as a Green Beret. As Secretary of State, Secretary LaRose has been doing his part in delivering a thriving democracy and proper, prosperous economy. In his role as Ohio's Chief Election Officer, he's working to ensure Ohio's elections are secure, accessible, and accurate. He is also supporting Ohio entrepreneurs as the sole authority to receive and approve articles of incorporation for Ohio businesses. Thank you for joining me today, Mr. Secretary. Um, you know, Thanks. as we... As we get closer to uh, the general election, as we get through primaries, one of the things we've been dealing with, obviously, is this unprecedented challenges with uh, COVID-19, the pandemic. And I know Ohio's had adjustments to your primary earlier this year. Could you talk a little bit about how the CARES Act have, has helped you uh, thus far in the primary and as you're planning for the general election? Well, thanks, Commissioner. And you're right to mention that uh, Ohio had the kind of unfortunate timing of our primary coming right at the beginning of this emergency that we were all facing as a nation and as a world, quite honestly. And really the same week that almost every state in the country was declaring a public health emergency was the time that Ohio was set to conduct uh, our primary, uh, March 17th. Now the governor made the decision along with the state health director that it would not be safe to conduct in-person voting. And so we responded by creating a scenario where we could conclude the primary exclusively by mail. Uh, the good news is Ohioans are very familiar with absentee voting because it's been a function of our elections in Ohio for close to 20 years. Uh, and the boards of elections had to really do a, a, a monumental job to be ready for that volume in the spring, but they got it done. Now, the money that we received from the CARES Act um, I've been very intentional about pushing that money out to the county boards of elections. In fact, over 90% of it has gone directly back out the door uh, to the front lines, if you will. And I spent 10 years in the army, as you mentioned, and I, one of my pet peeves in the military was always that, you know, those of us on the front lines who were the trigger pullers, uh, sometimes we didn't have the equipment we needed, but when you went back to the headquarters where people lived in air conditioned buildings and all that, they seemed to have all the latest and greatest. I always said if I'm in a position to, to do something about that, I would, and, and given that I have the ability to help allocate these resources, we said very early on that our team's going to make sure that the money goes out to the county boards of elections. One of the things that the counties are spending these uh, funds on is additional mail handling equipment, um, in some cases additional staff to be ready for what we can expect to be a higher volume of vote by mail uh, this, this, this fall, uh, but we're also spending those dollars uh, on things like additional personal protective equipment uh, so that we can make sure that in-person voting is safe and, and healthy for Ohioans as well. So uh, we're definitely making sure the dollars are spent well and efficiently, uh, and it's a big help. So in Ohio, you have folks that vote um, absentee or by mail, which I believe is like 25% of your population. You also have early voting where, per where individuals can vote in an election office, I believe, and then you have election day. Those CARES dollars, are they going to like clean polling places and ensure that those offices are ready for voters? Is that the type of thing that, that you're preparing for in November? Absolutely. In fact, uh, many of the counties um, have been investing those dollars to purchase personal protective equipment, uh, safety shields, uh, cleaning supplies, the necessary signage to inform people, uh, you know, what to do uh, when, when entering a polling location or to keep the uh, correct social distancing and that kind of thing. And you're right to mention that Ohio's, Ohioans have a lot of choices. Uh, and this is nothing new. This is thankfully not something that we had to kind of figure out during a pandemic. Ohioans for close to two decades, almost 20 years now, 
have had four weeks of early voting, which is again offered at your county board of elections generally. Uh, sometimes they use an, a, a different site, but four weeks of early voting that has evening and weekend hours, so it's really easy uh, to access. We have four weeks of absentee voting, where as long as you, uh, you know, as long as you request an absentee ballot uh, and you're a registered voter, we're going to mail you one and you can mail it back. Uh, and then, of course, convenient uh, in-person election day voting. Uh, we're going to make sure that it's healthy and safe uh, and accessible, and that's what these CARES dollars are being used for. And, and actually, we're also part, of, you know, partnering this with some of the HAVA funds that, that we had to spend still uh, that are being dedicated to accessibility type issues and security type issues. And so really the federal spending that we have been able to access in this election cycle has been very helpful uh, and we're spending it wisely. Um, Don, one other thing that we're spending it on is mailing an absentee ballot request to every registered voter. And this is nothing new in Ohio as well. This is something my predecessor did uh, going back to the beginning of his administration. Ohioans are accustomed to getting that absentee ballot request in the mail. It's something that, uh, that we do in those even numbered years. So both presidential and gubernatorial elections. And the question comes why, why those years? Well, because those are the years that we see the highest volume and the more people that vote absentee uh, are the fewer that we have to accommodate on election day. So it's a good thing uh, to see people take advantage of that, which again, in Ohio is, is nothing new. So we're sending out 7.8 million absentee ballot requests. So every registered voter in the state is gonna receive one uh, just after Labor Day weekend. Secretary LaRose, I also uh, read in the news that you were working really closely with the post office just to make sure that all the efficiencies are being used and that individuals sort of understand the deadlines. Uh, could you want to talk a little bit about your interaction with the post office? I think it's sort of a, um, you know, something other states could emulate. So in the primary, we were starting to hear concerns. I remember Ohio concluded our primary as an exclusively postal uh, election, which, um, you know, was a, a one-time thing at the very beginning of the pandemic. And to be clear, uh, I, I am not a fan of, of exclusively postal voting. I think that there needs to be choices. You know, people can vote by mail if they're comfortable with that, but there also has to be in-person options available. But in the primary, the decision made by our legislature was to conclude it exclusively by mail. And so we were starting to hear these stories about delays. Uh, the boards of elections and, and some voters were reporting to us that, that mail was taking two and sometimes three times as long as it was supposed to take. We took action uh, and actually worked through our congressional delegation to get the U.S. Postal Service engaged. I had a meeting by phone, of course, that included the deputy postmaster, that included the person in charge of all the elections mail for the U.S. Postal Service, as well as their operations manager. And they were willing to, to, to make a, a few uh, changes to us in the final days of Ohio's primary. Uh, one of them was to institute what they called an all clear procedure, which is just like it sounds. They send a management level postal official through their sorting facility and make sure that they are all clear of any election related mail. And as you know, it's so important that that official elections mail logo be uh, on any piece of mail that pertains to elections administration. And that distinctive logo is assigned to the post office that this is a high priority piece of mail. Well, with an all clear procedure, they go through their sorting facility and make sure that there's not a box of, uh, of election related mail uh, frustrated in the, in the process or stuck in a machine or, or whatever else they make sure to, to move out all of that election related mail. Uh, in Ohio, they also were willing to move their sorting for Northwest Ohio back into the state. Um, because of whatever uh, decisions the post office had made about efficiency over the last few years, they had decided to move Northwest Ohio's mail sorting into Detroit. They have a massive uh, sorting facility in Detroit. Well, that may be more efficient for them, but it also adds some time to the process because now mail from Toledo has to truck up to Michigan, get sorted, and then truck back. Uh, and they were, for that period of time, willing to bring the sorting back into Ohio, which cut down the transit time. Uh, and then finally, uh, working at the local level to make sure that there was a person to person handoff. So that, for example, the boards of elections, when they've got their outbound mail uh, that's green tagged, uh, which is, you know, for elections uh, folks like us, we know that that means that it's, you know, it's the uh, elections related mail. Um, but that handoff happens so that it doesn't just go into the sort of general pile. Uh, but, it, but it's sort of given the special handling that it deserves, particularly toward the end of the election cycle and, and when the, uh, the deadline is starting to loom. Now, I think that the most important thing, though, is, is one of voter responsibility. 
uh, commissioner. And this is where if I could get if I could get a message to every registered voter in the state, other than get registered to vote and, and sign up to be a poll worker, the, the message would be that I want every Ohioan to hear loud and clear is do not delay. Procrastination is a terrible idea as it relates to absentee voting. Uh, you're going to get your absentee ballot request from me in a few weeks, fill it out, mail it in right away. Don't leave it sitting on your kitchen counter. And then a few weeks after that in early October, in fact, officially starting October 6th, that's when the boards of elections are going to start mailing out absentee ballots. As soon as you receive it, make your choices, sign the envelope, and mail it back in. Do not delay and wait till the end, because if everybody waits until, you know, the last week of the election to mail in their ballots, we're going to have, a, you know, a different kind of a curve. We're all used to seeing that virus curve, right? Um, but the problem is we're going to have the spike in, in, in all of the election mail right at the end, and by the way, that's when the boards of elections are busiest preparing for the in-person aspect of voting and making sure that everything's ready to go for that. And so really we want to flatten the, the curve as it relates to elections mail and make sure that we get our FC ballots sit in as early as possible. Do not delay is the bottom line. The Secretary of Rose, I think we both served as overseas military voters at some point. What would your message be for them? Start early or start even earlier? I think that would probably be the message. What, what are you thinking about with those voters? How, did, how do they get ahead of the curve here and make sure their ballot gets counted? So you're right. Uh, we've both experienced uh, that overseas service and um, it, it adds uh, a little complication to everything. Uh, but the people that are defending our freedom should certainly have the opportunity to participate in it. In fact, you may not know this, Commissioner, but this is the way I got involved working on elections issues initially. <laughs> Uh, when I first started serving as a brand new state senator back in 2011, uh, at the time, Secretary of State John Husted asked me to partner with him on a bill to improve UACAVA or overseas military voting in Ohio. And uh, that sort of got me started on this journey of working on elections related issues. And that's why eight years later I ran for this office. Uh, and and the, just the, the, the love that I have for elections and the experience that I was able to get working on elections related issues. Um, Overseas military voters, overseas civilian voters, for that matter, any overseas voter, family members, uh, members of the the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the the Peace Corps or the State Department or the various intelligence services, uh, anybody that's 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 overseas who is a United States citizen should cast their ballot. We give extra time for that. Uh, in Ohio, that process starts 46 days before the election when those. UACAVA, which means overseas uh, military and civilian ballots start going out 46 days in advance. What a lot of people don't realize is that overseas personnel may actually request their ballot electronically, meaning that it will be emailed to you. It's not transmitted electronically. No ballots are transmitted electronically, but it's emailed to you. You have to print it out and fill it out manually, and you still have to sign it manually and then mail it back manually. Uh, so it still has to be transmitted through the mail, but we can cut the process in half by emailing you your ballot that you can then print out yourself. And for our military personnel, that means go, go find the MWR computer somewhere or whatever else and, and print it off and, and get it in. So there are a lot of good options. The time starts early. And for anybody who's, uh, who's interested in this, we have a person in our office whose dedicated full-time job is military and veteran liaison work. Uh, his name is Aaron Locker. He himself is a wounded warrior, um, and his email address is just a locker, a l o c k e r at ohio s o s dot gov, um, and uh, you can also check our website voteohio dot gov under military and overseas voters, and you'll see all kinds of information on there. But uh, nobody should sit out this election, even if you're serving far from home or living far from home uh, overseas. Secretary LaRose, I uh, recall that you did file a number of bills to help the military, including online or electronic registration. I remember I was at the Bipartisan Policy Center at the time, and, and it was really something that we were able to advocate with you and, and talk to the legislature about. Um, so all these aspects really help those that are overseas, um, and in the case of myself and others in the military. Um, dollars in HAVA security funds. And how has that been, you know, once that was made available to you, how did you use that? And what are some of your plans for that? Um, 
for that being used uh, in, in 2020 and beyond. Yeah, so uh, I, I had a little blip in our internet connection. I lost the first part of your question, but I think uh, you were asking about HAVA security funds, the, the dollars that had been uh, dedicated to that purpose and how we put those dollars to use. Is that correct? Yes, yes it was. Yeah, again, just like with the CARES funding, uh, we pushed out the vast majority of that money to our counties. Uh, I recognized early on that as it related to cybersecurity, uh, where some of the biggest vulnerabilities were is out at our county boards of elections. Again, Ohio has 88 county boards of elections. We've got a very decentralized form of elections administration. That is a strength in many ways, but it also brings with it some challenges. And uh, what that means is that those 88 county boards of elections reflect the diversity of Ohio. I mean, we have county boards of elections uh, that amount to two people that work in the courthouse basement and do a really good job and work really hard, but they, they don't have a whole lot of equipment and and they don't have a large operation and a large support network around them. And then we have county boards of elections with 100, and plus, 100 or more employees with their own full-time IT department and, and everything that goes along with that. And so uh, we focused on getting those dollars out to the county boards of elections, along with a 34-point security checklist that we gave the boards of elections. And we said, you have until the end of January uh, 2020. Uh, to get that done. And by the way, at the end of January 2020, we had every county except for I think two or three that had completed that. And then the two or three that needed a little bit of remedial help, we got them uh, completed as well. But we were doing things such as requiring every county board of elections to have an intrusion sensor, one of these Albert detectors that effectively can monitor the network for any kind of uh, nefarious activity and then uh, respond at, at any hour of the day or night monitored by uh, an organization that's partnered with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Uh, we required background checks. Uh, we required training and things like phishing. And really the human aspect of this is so important, making sure that the boards of elections are prepared uh, to be a human firewall, if you will, to, to do basic things like setting secure passwords and uh, not opening attachments that you don't know about. And so a lot of that work got done. I think, oh, and by the way, changing all of our boards of elections to a secure .gov uh, domain so that all of them have a, a .gov email and, and, and website, uh, which is not only safer from the virus standpoint, uh, but also it provides an additional uh, public uh, confidence so that people know when they go to a .gov website that they can trust uh, that they are an official government source of, of information. And so those were some of the things that we did with those dollars. I think that Ohio is really leading the nation as it relates to cybersecurity. It's something that we've been very aggressive about. So take a step back four years, you know, you know, it's been from four years ago, how would you compare the security posture we were then where we are now? Are we more secure? What's our resiliency now than it was then? And, and should voters be more confident just generally even though there's bad actors that are always sort of knocking on our door, um, checking our fence, how, from your view as a chief election official in, in Ohio, are we more secure and do we have more resilience than we did four years ago? No question about it. In fact, in many ways, the difference is night and day. Uh, the support that we're getting from our federal partners is really incredible. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security has been great to work with. Uh, Chris Krebs and, and company at CISA, uh, have been excellent to work with and have been constant partners of ours, but also the relationships extend laterally between the states. My uh, chief information security officer and my CIO talk with their counterparts in other states constantly. The information sharing that we're able to do through the ISAC community is incredible. The support that we're getting at the state level, and, and in a minute I, I hope to get the chance to talk about an innovative thing that we started in Ohio called the Ohio Cyber Reserve, which is an actually a unit within the National Guard. It's civilians, it's not uh, you know military members that went to basic training and that kind of thing, but it's the best minds that we have in the state that are organized as a reserve force to respond um, not if, but when there's a cyber attack, because it's, it's inevitable, uh, really. And uh, the fact that public awareness has increased as well. Uh, things like disinformation are realities of, of, of life that we need to be aware of. There are foreign adversaries that want to spread false information and confuse and disorient uh, voters. Those are, that's all part of the same conversation and something that we have to be aware of. And one of the things that we've been doing in Ohio 
is offering disinformation training so that minority community leaders and, 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 and members of the media can understand exactly how this works and what, you know, in the military we would have called propaganda just a few years ago and we have a fancy, fancy term for it. Now we call it disinformation, but it's a lot of the same thing. It's spreading false, false narratives and it's something that we should be aware of. And, and again, that goes part uh, hand in hand with uh, combating cyber attacks because it's a, a, a lot of the same kind of nefarious efforts that are that are involved there and it's important for people to know that we're going to combat it uh, and we're going to make sure that when the ballots are counted that it's uh, the voice of the, the people of Ohio that are heard in a free and fair election and, and that's the bottom line. So let's talk a little bit about your cyber reserve. I know this was an initiative that you started back when you were in the state senate and pushed for and and now as secretary, you're helping to build. What's that relationship like with your secretary of state's office and the National Guard? I know that's it's sort of within the National Guard, but, it, yeah. but, it's a, but it's a civilian force. Talk a little bit more about that relationship and how you work together to protect Ohio's elections. Well, it's a terrific relationship. And uh, in fact, the, the two-star general uh, who commands the Ohio National Guard is a, is a gentleman named Harris. And General Harris and I actually served together when I was in the military. So our relationship goes a long way back. Um, we've worked together a lot because they have a capability uh, organic to their organization where they've got service members, military members, United States military members who are uh, cybersecurity experts, uh, who are experts at uh, you know combating uh, hacking and, and, and system resiliency and getting systems back up and running. That's the, the, the capability that they have within their ranks as far as military members that can do that work. But of course, in, in the event of a large scale attack, uh, they need some more help. They, they need some, some more people. And so the idea was to create a cyber reserve. This is a reserve force. It's, you can almost compare it to the volunteer fire department, right? I mean, uh, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to have a uh, full-time fire department uh, on call 24 seven, but when there is a problem, you need to be able to call in well-trained people to respond to that problem that are able to immediately respond to. It. And that's what the cyber reserve is all about. The other part of this is that I think for too long, people have thought that there is some, um, you know, the cavalry that you call that comes riding in uh, if, if, if there's a catastrophe. And in many cases, there hasn't been, there is not. Uh, that kind of response force that's available. Of course, you know, if the, if the, if there's a, uh, a medical emergency, you call the EMS. If there's a fire, you call the fire department. If there's a law, a law, law enforcement related emergency, you call the police department. But who do you call when there's a cyber related emergency, particularly for those entities that are state, uh, local, county government partners, as well as critical infrastructure, which of course, uh, elections are both critical infrastructure and uh, a county government function, at least in Ohio. Uh, and so uh, the Ohio Cyber Reserve has been organized. This is a piece of legislation that I started working on when I was in the Senate, uh, has been organized as part of the National Guard because they have the right structure, rank structure and everything else for how to, how to put this together and do the recruiting. The idea is to have regional teams throughout the state. Uh, these individuals get together and train periodically. Uh, they don't wear a uniform per se, but they probably have a, a polo shirt on it or, or with a logo on it or whatever that says Ohio Cyber Reserve. And the idea is when the worst case happens, when there is a, uh, a major cyber related attack in Ohio, uh, these folks can be called to duty. They're paid once they're activated. They would leave their civilian job for a period of time, maybe a couple weeks where they maybe worked previously at a bank or, or uh, a, a company, a financial institution, or, or who knows what, any, any number of places that, that cybersecurity experts work uh, in and around the state of Ohio. And, and then they would be activated and sent to the scene uh, where their focus would be on resiliency, getting systems back up and running again. Um, in many cases, when there's an attack, uh, the investigators want to come in and do their forensics and figure out who done it so that they can file criminal charges or, 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 or pursue uh, the bad guy. That's important. Uh, it's important that we do that. But what's equally as important is that we get these critical systems back up and running, particularly, again, critical infrastructure, state and local and county government uh, resources. People are relying on these and they need to get up and running again. And then one other aspect that the Ohio Cyber Reserve can perform and will perform 
is routine training and and uh, and and helping to prevent attacks, uh, helping to helping to harden our defenses. Again, if you're going to get the cyber reserve units together for periodic training, just like the, the National Guard would uh, on the weekends, uh, every now and then, uh, one of the things they can spend their weekend training period doing is 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 examining uh, the current state of defense and and helping offer suggestions about how to strengthen it. So this has been a great conversation. Um, we're about 90 days out from the election as we're speaking today, uh, probably a couple of extra uh, nights here, but what are, what's the main major things that you're focused on as you get within 90 and 60 days of the election? Um, we've got the, you've been working on the security side of this and obviously COVID has been, um, you know, a challenge um, for state and local officials. What are you focused on the last 90 days just to make sure everything runs smoothly. Yeah, Commissioner, you're right to mention, um, you know, a lot of pandemic related things specifically as far as the health and safety of our poll, uh, poll workers as well as our voters and making sure that those polling locations are set up correctly. You're right to mention that cybersecurity continues to be a major focus. We have not and will not take our eyes off the ball on that. Uh, in fact, one of the things that our foreign adversaries want us to do is to be distracted during a crisis. That tends to be the time uh, that they strike with things like cyber attacks. And so uh, we have actually increased our, our vigilance as it relates to that. And, and actually, good news to report there, we've had uh, some uh, uh, unsuccessful attacks uh, that, that were launched against us where we were able to uh, detect them and combat them. And, and the good guys won and the bad guys lost. And uh, and that's something that, you know, we don't rest on our laurels because we got to be ready to defend our systems tomorrow and the day after that and, and on and on. Uh, but the two things that I'm thinking about more than anything right now uh, are poll worker recruitment and voter registration. And, and by the way, that'll that'll shift a little bit in a few weeks. Uh, but right now, what we're focusing on is we need to remind Ohioans to get registered to vote. And if you're if if you are registered, to check your registration and make sure your address is up to date. If you're not uh, registered, then what are you waiting for? You can do it online at voteohio.gov. It takes just a few minutes. And if you are registered and you've been registered for years, consider being an evangelist for voter registration because there's a young person in your life that turned 18, whether it's one of your own children or grandchildren or the kid you know from church or whatever else. And so voter registration is important. In fact, uh, we just launched a collaborative with the Ohio Craft Brewing Association where beer cans and bottles at over 40 craft brewers in the state of Ohio are gonna have information right there on the can or the bottle about how to register to vote, including that website, voteohio.gov. Uh, we call it raise a glass to democracy. And so it, it's a, a thing that we've been going around the state promoting and I think beer and democracy uh, go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of great conversations happen at the, at the tap rooms and the pubs and that kind of thing. And so uh, why not put a reminder right there on the beer can or the beer bottle? So voter registration is crucial. Uh, the other thing though is poll worker recruitment. It takes over 35,000 Ohioans to staff close to 4,000 polling locations on election day. And for too long, I think we've been accustomed to, you show up uh, on election day, uh, you're gonna be greeted by one of your neighbors and they give you your ballot. And then on your way out the door, they give you your I voted sticker. Well, those folks didn't get there by accident. And in many cases, they've been doing it for decades. In many cases, our poll workers are into their 70s and 80s. And so are more concerned about the impacts of the virus than the rest of us are. And so it's time for us to recruit a whole new generation of Ohioans to take on this important duty of being a poll worker. And voteohio.gov slash defend democracy is the place to do that. And so we're encouraging through a whole lot of different means. Uh, we're now offering CLE credits through or the Ohio Supreme Court is offering CLE credits for lawyers who sign up to be poll workers. It took us a while to get that done, but we got that done through the Ohio Supreme Court. And we're encouraging businesses around Ohio to give their employees a paid day off. We call it give a day for democracy. That's just two of the ideas. 17 year olds can be poll workers in Ohio as part of our youth at the booth program. There's a whole variety of things that we're doing to recruit poll workers. And so uh, those are the, 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 the two things that we're focused on right now is voter registration and poll worker recruitment. Now in a few weeks that, that transitions to a full fledged voter information effort. And it's gonna be focused on the fact that Ohioans have three choices and we wanna make sure you know what your three choices are. That includes four weeks of early voting, four weeks of absentee voting and safe and healthy and efficient in-person voting on election day. And then reminding people do not delay, mail in your absentee ballot right away. So that's gonna be the focus of the conversation here in a few weeks. Well, great. Um, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you, Secretary LaRose. We really appreciate it. 
good luck in November. And we're going to be launching a, a national recruit, poll worker recruitment day, hopefully in the next week. And hopefully we can work together on that because it is a vital issue as we get closer and closer to November. With absolutely. that, I'm going to go ahead, Secretary LaRose. I would say absolutely. Uh, and I hope if there's a silver lining that comes out of this whole pandemic experience, uh, one of those silver linings could be that this is the year that we recruited a whole new generation of poll workers. We'd love to see it. We need, like I said, 35,000. Uh, again, as an old military guy, that's like two full divisions uh, worth, of, uh, worth of poll workers. And so we're focused on that every day right now. Absolutely. Thank you, Secretary LaRoche. Thank you for your time. And once again, good luck in November. Thank you. Thank you.